Good day, everyone, and thank you so much um, for joining us today um, on the session on eliminating harmful practices against and promoting the human rights and protection for intersex people. My name is Crystal Hendricks. I'll be the moderator of the session today. I am the Intersex Rights Programs Officer for a South African-based organization called Iranti, and I also serve as the ILGA World's Intersex Chair. Today's event is entitled Eliminating Harmful Practices Against and Promoting Human Rights Protection of Intersex People. It is organized by the Equal Rights Coalition with support of the UN Human Rights Office and Intersex Human Rights Australia. We thank the ERC, the, work, the ERC Working Group on National Laws and Policies with Rainbow Railroad and its Civil Society's co-chair for supporting this event. I wanted to also note that the thematic group is seeking a, a state co-chair and wellness and any and all interest, please reach out to Doug Graffio for more information. His email address will be put in the chat. To this webinar and our distinguished speakers, we hope to exchange information on the international human rights law framework as it applies to intersex persons. Positive developments and challenges globally, as well as experiences in advancing legislative and policy change and policy change at the national level. I hope is that our participants, many are from representatives from ministries responsible for bringing about such changes, leave with new knowledge, tools and awareness of what is possible and very much needed in terms of progress in the protection of the human rights of intersex persons. Government and civil society representatives of over 40 countries registered for today's webinar, showing a high level of interest. Before opening remarks, I want to share some logistical information. First, Spanish and English interpretation is available. Second, if you have questions, you can put these in the chat or raise your hand during the Q&A of the webinar. Third, in terms of the structure, we will have opening remarks followed by a panel discussion. We will then open for questions and invite participants to share other national experiences before returning to our panelists for closing remarks. This webinar will be recorded with the aim of posting it on the ERC website for future reference. Finally, I want to emphasize that this should be a safe, respectful, and constructive discussion, conscious that not everyone is very familiar with these issues, we will ask you to use respectful language. In that vein, I want to be sure that everyone is clear on what we mean when we say intersex. Intersex is an umbrella term used to describe a wide range of innate bodily variations in sex characteristics. Intersex people are born with variations of sex characteristics that do not fit typical definitions of male and female bodies. This includes sexual anatomy, reproductive organs, hormonal patterns, and or chromosome patterns. You will find more information in the draft technical note that was circulated with the email invitation to this event. Now it's my great pleasure to turn to Dr. Ina Marie Blomeyer, Head of Department for Queer Politics, Sexual and Gender Diversity of the German Federal Ministry for Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth. Dr. Marie Blomeyer is opening this event on behalf of the ERC co-chairs, Germany and Mexico. Dr. Blomeyer, please go ahead. Oh. So we're having a slight technical difficulty. But you know, technical difficulties happen, um, but this is still a very important conversation and I hope we will get Dr. Blomeyer um, to, to make some remarks later. I would like to open our panel discussion by turning to Dr. Taleng Mufukeng. Um, Dr. Taleng is a UN Special Rapporteur on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. She is a medical doctor with expertise in advocating for universal health access, HIV care, youth-friendly services, and family planning. Dr. Kaleng is on the board of numerous organizations and is a lecturer at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. In South Africa, she was a commissioner at the Commission 
Commission for Gender Equality and an advisor to the Technical Committee for the National Adolescent Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Framework Strategy, mobilizing across movements working on issues of children and adolescents, persons with disabilities, migrants, and persons living with HIV AIDS. Dr. Daleng also has expertise in responding to gender-based violence. Dr. Daleng, your mandate and other human rights bodies have highlighted that states have an obligation to enact laws and policies to eliminate harmful practices against intersex persons. Could you highlight the specific components of these obligations under international human rights law? Thank you, Dr. Daleng. Thank you, Crystal, um, and for inviting me to share the space with all of you and some insights. And I thought perhaps it's important to start with my own personal experience as a medical doctor, but early on, even as a medical student. <laughs> and what I have witnessed mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and how those experiences of being a medical student and a young medical doctor have been important as I undertake my mandate on the right to health. And, you know, of course, being a medical student, a young doctor, you witness, and I did as well, you know, newborn babies who were already um, questioned and there was already doubt um, within their very first minutes of birth. And, you know, the steps that followed sometimes included uh, observations by medical staff without often even telling their parents that they have concerns or sometimes talking to parents in a way that made them feel very worried and anxious about what the medics were then calling abnormalities, right? Based on what the medical staff was then seeing and observing based on external ex examination of the genitalia. And of course, this was based on what they deemed normal, which was very narrow definitions of what normal genitalia were. And so much of the conversations, you know, were more on causing concern and not very informative and, and even less so about the well being of the child and the family regarding their physiology or mental health um, and support for the caregivers. And without, of course, um, a care for the stigma that's already often internalized, but also very present in the communities. So the timing of the conversations about some of the interventions that the doctors then thought was necessary, often surgical, was also very telling in that a lot of these conversations were rushed um, and there was no other consideration. Um, and it seemed to me that these were more cosmetic considerations rather than based on a physiological need or physiological support of the newborn child. And in many countries, we know when a, a, a fetus is born, um, the, the, there's this practice where they ask the mom, you know, look between the legs, what do you think it is? And then you either say boy or girl. Again, even obstetric care in how we approach it already can, you can just see um, that it's already predetermined in terms of um, sex, in terms of genitalia. And some of the very first conversations that people are having when a child is born is around genitalia. And often we don't see the link between that practice that seems to be just innocent and in passing and just accepted that that's just we all do to celebrate the birth um, and how they lead into policy or they lead into other areas of life that impact intersex persons. For example, um, I live in South Africa and I have have to fill in a birth certificate or a birth notification. And on that certificate already you are asked the gender and you don't have options except uh, um, sorry, sex in terms of male or female. And so even on the official documentation that provides you your citizenship, you are already put into these very binary uh, boxes, which makes it even harder later on to then come out of. And as my pre predecessors in this mandate of the right to health, I continue to participate in these convenings such as today to continue to advance human rights and provides insights into why the right to health approach, which is a life cycle approach that looks at the needs of individuals from preconception up until they die, and why this is important. Um, and based on my own clinical work and experiences, I've been advocating for respectful care 
for example, I used to incorporate antenatal classes um, that have information on intersex health and that doctors and all other healthcare professionals that pregnant people come into contact with need to have a curriculum and training updates that are anchored in human rights. I wasn't taught human rights in medical school. I know my colleagues are still not taught human rights. And so the unlearning of these harmful practices that we have been taught, um, we have to move you know, to a thorough understanding and, and unlearning of those harmful practices um, and teachings that are not essentialist. Um, and I call it the medical fraternity because I feel that it's still a boys club. It is the fraternity still. Um, it must listen and be led by intersex persons in defining what respectful and human rights based approaches to care look like for them. And we know that, um, you know, that in addition to um, the practices that I'm talking about, we have forced or coercive medical interventions that continue to happen, even in countries where on paper, these are not supposed to be no longer happening, but we know we still have reports of this happening. There's continuous stigma, both internalized, but also in society and in communities. Intersex children and adults are subjected to human rights violations. And often the violations that happened in childhood, for many people, they only realize in their adulthood. And so there's this issue of prescription, right? That what happened to you, you can only report it as a violation after a couple of years, after that you can no longer. So we also need to think about what recourse looks like when something happens to you as an intersex child, but you really only get the full understanding of what that is as an adult. And so these human rights violations include violence, infanticide, um, and discrimination, of course, because the rights and human rights are interlinked. A violation in one aspect of human rights enables violations in other um, human rights areas. And so discrimination in education, in healthcare, in employment, in sport, in access to services and goods and facilities, and of course to medical records are very, very important to understand. And these obstacles, of course, are faced as well in the area of legal recognition of gender identity, where these differ from the sex assigned to them at birth. And remember that picture I gave to you when it's doctors and nurses um, you know, deciding on what sex to assign and therefore based on that sex, there are particular gender roles um, and binaries that are then expected and imposed on people. And so these practices can undermine um, fundamentally the right to life, equality and non-discrimination. They also undermine health, physical and mental integrity and of course recognition before the law, as well as freedom from torture and ill treatment. And I think it's also important to underscore that intersex people have a right to access justice and remedy for when violations have occurred and that there may be policy or legal obstacles that makes this even harder to achieve for intersex persons. And now moving on to the obligations on the part of states. We know that human rights are a language of obligation. Human rights are not reserved or a privilege of some and not others. They are for all people, simply for being human. And the key principles that I continue to, to talk about that shape human rights under the right to health are non-discrimination, equality, transparency, participation, accountability, and recourse. And ultimately, this is important for autonomy and dignity. And in the um, Article 12 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the state's obligations are well articulated, but also in general comment number 14, as well as in many other international and regional instruments. And more and more, we are using the courts to advance jurisprudence as well in, this, in these matters. Some of the obligations include that as part of their duty, the state has to protect against human rights abuses, and they must take appropriate steps to ensure through either judicial, administrative, legal, or other appropriate means that when abuses occur within their territory or jurisdiction, those affected have a right to effective remedy. And I think this is very important to talk about because often we think about the courts, um, uh, you know, to get justice. And there are many other layers as well, like administrative, legislative, but like in, in appropriate means, for example, as healthcare workers, we need to be talking to the deans of universities. We need to be talking to the health professions council that give doctors licenses to practice as other forms as well 
and other steps of effective uh, remedy. The other obligation on the state is to respect the right to health and refrain from denying or limiting equal access for all persons. I think this is very, very important because by the very definition of what we're talking about here, we can see how when your gender identity and expression does not match the sex assigned at birth, we know in reality every single aspect of society, there will be limitations in terms of your social, political, economic, civil rights. And so we know um, that the extent to which the right to health is realized often determines the state to which other human rights are realized. And it's upon the state to respect um, and, and, and refrain from denying or limiting equal access. The last um, obligation I wanted to speak to, and I will reserve my um, other comments for the, for the floor, is that um, the states have a duty to adopt legislation to ensure equal access. So it's not enough to refrain from causing harm, but they have to actually take measures to ensure that harm is not caused and that equal access is guaranteed. And I think what's also important is that this applies to third parties. So states cannot say private doctors or private companies or private hospitals are you know, outside of their bounds. They actually have a duty to ensure that third parties do not limit people's access. And they do have a duty to ensure that the national political and legal systems by a way of legislation and implementation adopt a policy on a national level. So taking all of these international human rights laws and standards and consensus documents and actually make them into national domestic health policy with a detailed plan for realizing the right to health. And I just wanted to say that um, trustful relationships and partnerships between policymakers, the health sector, civil society, and those who are affected by these rights violations are really, really important and the cornerstone of effective health systems and how we can move from harmful practices to a life of dignity for intersex people and societies that are conducive to a life of dignity for intersex people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Taleng, um, for that very helpful overview of international human rights law framework in relation to the rights of intersex person. And just listening to your conversation, just last week we met with six parents of intersex children. And when we asked them if there was one thing that they could change, and they said all they wish they had more time. They had more time to make a decision. They wish they, they were informed. They wish there was opportunity for them to research. But because of how the medical fraternity or the medical society is set up, parents feel that they are cornered and they have to make a decision there and then um, for their child because they don't want to risk the life of their child. And I think it's so important that we utilize these mechanisms to ensure that not only are we educating intersex people, not only are we educating state, and but we're also educating the parents of intersex children because they are also very important. I do believe that we have Dr. Blomeyer. I do apologize, Dr. Blomeyer, for that technical um, difficulties, um, but we will now um, give you an opportunity um, for opening remarks. You can go ahead, Dr. Blomeyer. Thank you very much. I hope now everything is fine and you can hear me and see me. Um, distinguished members of the ERC, distinguished experts on the right rights of intersex persons. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome you to this very important webinar organized by the Equal Rights Coalition National Laws and Policy Group. The Equal Rights Coalition stands out as a one-of-a-kind multilateral mechanism of member states collaborating with civil society towards the same aim to advance the rights of LGBTI persons. Together with Mexico, Germany took over as co-chair of the ERC in September 2022. We are proud to be part of an alliance of 42 states and over 140 NGOs committed to eliminating all forms of violence discrimination and marginalization experienced by LGBTI people based on their sexual orientation, their gender identity or gender expression or 
their sex characteristics. As part of this commitment, the inclusion of intersex persons does not simply mean to add an I to LGBT. Strengthening the rights of intersex persons, it is quite simple, but about accepting people for who they are, ensuring that any, everyone can live a self-determined life in dignity and embracing humanity in all its diversity. Living a life that corresponds to who you are should be left up to each individu individual and not be dependent on external views. Outlawing harmful practices on intersex persons, therefore, should be a key priority. This is it, why it is important that this is the focus of strategic objectives two of the ERC's strategy plan 2021 to 2026 and its implementation plan. When it comes to harmful practices against intersex persons, human rights bodies have paved the way to ensure that medically unnecessary surgery and treatments without consent are understood for, uh, for what they really are, grave human rights violations. International forums can have an immediately catalytic effect, especially when governments partner up with civil society. This is why we are excited about this format today. This is also why we support efforts at various levels. For instance, the Council of Europe's work on development on developing uh, a recommendation on strengthening the rights of intersex persons. Today's webinar forms part of the programmatic agenda of the ERC's national laws and policies thematic group. It provides space when member states and civil society can exchange best practices and lessons learned. In doing so, this group offers a, a unique opportunity to advance the ERC's objectives at home. Such a space becomes crucial when considering the topic of today's webinar. There are only few forums where governments can come together to learn from each other and push for progress in relation to intersex people. I hope that you will leave today with greater knowledge, practical insights and new ideas on how you, your ministry, your government and your state can better protect the human rights of intersex people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marie Blomeyer, for those opening words. We really appreciate you joining us today and Germany's commitment to the ERC and to taking steps to increase the protection of the rights of intersex persons. I would like to echo what you said. Can we just accept people for who they are? And that's the most essential thing. I understand that you need to leave for another engagement. So I thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much. We will now be moving um, over to our panelists. I would like to turn to Mara Cabral Crispin. Mara serves as a senior officer for gender justice and equality at the Global Philanthropy Project. Before that, he co founded Gate in 2009, serving as its executive director between 2017 and 2022. He participated in the elaboration of the Yogyakarta Principles 2007 and of the Yogyakarta Principles Plus 10 in 2017 and co-authored the Argentinian Bill on the Comprehensive Protection of Sex Characteristics. Mara has been involved in intersex advocacy since 1996. Since 2013, he coordinates the Argentinian Task Force Justicia Intersex. 
He edited the book in Interdictions, Intersex Writing in Spanish, and has published extensively on intersex issues. Mario lives in Brussels. Mario, at a global level, can you share with us the positive developments and remaining challenges in effective elimination of harmful practice against intersex persons and the fulfillment of their rights? Thank you, Mario. Thank you very much, uh, Crystal, for the introduction and for the question and for everyone to be here. Uh, intersex activism started 30 years ago, and since then, it has been focused on ending all kinds of procedures, surgical, uh, hormonal, mechanical, aimed to normalize intersex bodies or the bodies uh, of people born with variations of sex characteristics. At this moment, there are intersex groups, organizations, and networks working at all levels from local organizing, national, regional, and international levels. And they work at the same time on different issues that go from providing support to the intersex community to reporting human rights violations based, based on sex characteristics at the UN. A central portion of that work is focused on national laws and policies, banning all forms of medical intervention to alter a person's sex characteristics when those interventions are not medically necessary and uh, when they are perform without the informed consent of the concerned person. Most countries in the world doesn't address intersex issues at all, basically because they consider intersex issues to be medical issues. This situation usually gives doctors the authority to perform that kind of interventions, which are considered harmful, harmful practices against intersex people, and which can also amount to torture, cruel, or inhuman treatment. However, over the past eight years, several countries and regional jurisdictions have passed laws aiming to protect intersex uh, people. Those countries include Malta, Portugal, Iceland, Spain, Greece, Germany, Kenya, and also some territories, including the Australian Capital Territory that just passed their legislation in June 2023. The government of the Tamil Nadu passed an executive order protecting intersex people, and other countries have bills pending to be treated at the parliament, including uh, Chile, Kenya, and my own country, Argentina. In other cases, intersex issues have been positively addressed by ministries of health, like in the case of Albania, Israel, Israel and Mexico. And in other cases, progress has been made by the judiciary system at the national, regional, or city level, as in the cases of Colombia, Austria, Germany, Madras, Delhi, and Brussels. Uh, these examples of legal and policy reform are key evidence that advancing the human rights of intersex people is possible and achievable at the national level. But also the same laws and policies that I just mentioned, not all of them, but some of them, are very good examples of the urgent need of involving experts from the intersex community in all stages of the problem, uh, of the process, sorry, <laughs> from the inception to the implementation and monitoring of that implementation. As in several cases, best intentions haven't made best outcomes, and some mistakes that have been avoidable and preventable have been made, even when, you know, that could be really those mistakes could have been prevented just by involving and consulting with the intersect community. So at this moment in time, the progress on intersex human rights at the national level is facing three major challenges. And we could find other challenges <laughs> later in the conversation. Let's start with this with these three. The first one is that even when prog progressive laws and policies are including um, protections for intersex uh, people, they are in several cases, including certain intersex variations and excluding others. It means that the bodily integrity of some intersex people is protected by law and the bodily integrity of other intersex people is left out from protection. And while this separation is frequently presented by lawmakers as to be solved in the future, as a next step, we all know how difficult it is to change a law once the law is, has been passed. So 
I want to remind everyone that intersex mutilation must be banned and it must be banned for all in order to be effective. The second challenge is this. Uh, laws and policies concerning intersex issues tend to protect babies and children from genital mutilation. However, the issues affecting intersex adults whose bodies have already been mutilated are not taken into consideration by laws and policies. It's urgent to include those issues to ensure that victims of human rights violations based on sex characteristics can enjoy the right to physical and mental health care, the right to reparative justice, and the right to truth. We still live in a world where access to medical records uh, keep being impossible for many people, intersex people around the world. Finally, several countries and states, um, including Ghana, Oman, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and the United States, are passing laws that are ex that explicitly allow or even encourage doctors to perform normalizing interventions. For example, while gender affirming, aff affirming procedures are prohibited for trans people, procedures focused on children born with variations of sex characteristics are allowed. In other cases, and in, in this case, especially in the US, many laws and regulations targeting trans people are also targeting intersex people, including those laws or regulations restricting access to public restrooms according to sex assigned at birth or even according to chromosomes. When we take into consideration, for example, the force of anti-gender movements around the world and the race of increasing authoritarianism, we know, and, and probably we all agree or we can discuss that, that the, these are dangerous times, but at the same time for intersex legal reform, these are promising times and the good examples of legislation are a very good sign of that. Normalizing interventions on intersex bodies are a living relic from the past, and intersex movements are working to make sure that those interventions go where they belong. Basically, history books that talk about the horrors from the past and talk how those horrors, horrors were ended and how justice was, was achieved. So all of us in this call have a real opportunity of making history together by supporting intersex people's human rights. Thank you very much for inviting me to work. Thank you um, so much, Mara, for giving us that sense of some of the places where things are really moving forward, but also some of the obstacles we still have to overcome um, for intersex people to obtain their human rights. And I, I just want to echo what you said, that intersex genital mutilation needs to be banned before all, and all states need to have um, laws and policies that promote and protect the rights of intersex people. I think it's very essential and very important. Thank you so much. I now turn to Dr. Kari Holmar Ragnarsson. Um, Dr. Kari is an assistant professor of law at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. I hope I said that right, Iceland, where he teaches international law, human rights, and constitutional law. His research interests and publications include law and politic economy, equality and non-discrimination, socioeconomic rights, constitution making, and climate change. In 2019, Dr. Kari was appointed by the Iceland Prime Minister as an expert in human rights law and an interdisciplinary working group on children born at variations in sex characteristics. He subsequently acted as lead drafter of a proposal supported by the working group that became law in Iceland in 2020. He continues to advise the Prime Minister's office on issues relating to human rights and is working on research on the impact of the 2020 legislation. Dr. Kerry, what has been the approach of Iceland in terms of developing policies and legislation for elimination of harmful practices against intersex persons and fulfillment of their rights? Why did you decide on the approach that you took? And also, what was the collaboration with civil society like in development of legislation? And what are the lessons learned from the overall process? Thank you, Dr. Curry. So thank you for uh, the invitation and, and this um, somewhat complicated question uh, to which I would give a 
five minutes answer. Um, so the Icelandic development happened uh, quite quickly uh, in a span of, of just a, a few, a couple of years, really, um, in the sense that uh, so intersex had been an almost entirely invisible issue. And it was only uh, put on the table in the public's eye, at least, by the uh, extraordinary work of uh, Icelandic intersex activists or advocates who stepped forward and, and uh, told uh, their stories and uh, raised the uh, the issue in the public uh, domain. And so this effort by Icelandic advocates was then complemented really by input from um, international organizations, primarily Amnesty International, who produced a, a, an alarming report about the issue in, in 2019. So that year, as you mentioned, uh, this interdisciplinary working group was put together, um, which included medical doctors, uh, lawyers, uh, expert, an expert on gender studies, a psychologist, and uh, crucially, the uh, leaders of the main LGBTI groups. Um, and the work resulted in legislative changes in 2020. And before I tell you a little bit about what that law contains, I should remind you that obviously Iceland is a very small place. So this effort did involve really putting in the same room all of the uh, most relevant people on the medical side, and also the really principal advocates for intersex issues, as well as then, you know, myself and, and a broader group of, of interdisciplinary experts who had sort of various degrees of involvement in the issue previously. And this, I can tell you, was sometimes a, a, a bit of a tricky process, um, but it also was, I believe, what did result in, in at least some uh, changes. So the end result of this process was a kind of a compromise. Uh, this 2020 legislation has a core of it, basically a two-part rule. So first, there's a general rule, a general prohibition of non-therapeutic intervention to children born with variations in sexual characteristics. So this means that social, psychosocial, and appearance-related factors are not acceptable as reasons for medical infringement. And the rule is then backed up with procedures, so procedural rules on how decisions on these medical interventions are to be made, involving, again, an interdisciplinary team of experts advising parents and producing a reasoned and detailed assessment of the risks and benefits involved with these procedures. So the second part of the, the rule was then uh, exception. So two exceptions were made to this general prohibition. So this involved firstly surgery due to what's known as hypostatias, which is when the opening of the urethra is not located at the hip of the penis. And secondly, an exception for medication to treat micropenis, which is a, a simply has to do with the smallness of a child's penis. Uh, so these two interventions were not prohibited, even if they are, at least sometimes, based on social reasons or, or appearance. So however, while they're not completely prohibited, they are limited, they are subject to the same elaborate decision-making process. So they're not supposed to be treated by like normal uh, procedures. And these two carve-outs, just to address uh, them directly, were definitely the most disputed within this working group, and they have been criticized by uh, human rights groups and, and others. And the way we saw it was that this format was indispensable. Uh, it was indeed indispensable from the point of view of the medical experts involved. And, um, and without those exemptions, I believe the legislation would have lost important support from within the medical community and probably not have passed uh, parliament. So it was a compromise uh, in, of, of sorts. Uh, and so at the end of this year, uh, a new committee will be formed to review this law based on experience and based also on developments elsewhere. And uh, if I can just leave you with a, a few lessons from this 
process, which I think of as a work in progress, as opposed to a, a completed success story or something like that. It's not, it's, it's something that we continue to monitor and uh, review. Um, so first lesson, in order to get anything done here, it did prove necessary to maintain the support of the medical community. Uh, and secondly, and just as importantly, the involvement of civil society here was crucial. Uh, intersex advocates, as I mentioned, put the issue on the table, and they were also very influential on the final product, uh, although clearly they, they did not like the exceptions made to the, the general rule, as I described. So third lesson is probably that a, a human rights-based approach did provide uh, a common ground to really frame the issue and uh, material from international human rights bodies was taken very seriously in the process and did have quite a bit. However, a lot of work remained to be done at the national level to figure out all of the details on how to put these principles in practice. Uh, and finally, as a lesson, uh, we have been finding out, which is not unique to Iceland, that implementation of the law seems to be uh, somewhat less effective than had been hoped. So there is this distance, as it seems, between the statutory law and then the day-to-day -day functioning of the healthcare system, which is proven difficult to fully uh, bridge. Um, so in concrete terms, this means that some medical inter interventions, uh, in particular, hypospadia surgery have continued uh, without following the procedural rules of the 2020 law. And also some other elements of the law like uh, data collection, which we were quite happy with actually, uh, has not been fully put into practice. Uh, so these are, are the lessons at least that uh, in Iceland we will be taking along for the revision of the law which is scheduled for, for next year. Uh, so we'll leave it there, thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Kari, for that input. It's so helpful to hear about the concrete and positive changes, um, but also some of the more challenging aspects um, of this entire process, you know, and it also makes us realize that it is always room for improvement, there's always room for continuous development, and there's always room to continue the conversation um, to see how best we can support um, intersex people um, to realize their rights. Thank you so much. Our next panelist will be able to add um, to this picture with another concrete experience in advancing the rights of intersex persons from the perspective of a national human rights institute. I would like to put my last question to the panel to Professor Rosalind Croucher. Emeritus Professor Rosalind Croucher is president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Prior to joining the commission, Rosalind was president and commissioner of the Australian Law Reform Commission, where she led a number of significant law reform inquiries, including on secrecy laws, family violence, age barriers to work, disability laws, encroachment on freedoms in the Commonwealth laws, and elder abuse. As president, she also over, oversaw inquiries such as native title and serious invasions of privacy. Rosalind has a distinguished career in legal education prior to 2007, with 25 years in university teaching and management. In 2015, she was appointed a member of the Order of Australia for significant service to the law as an academic, to legal reform and education, to professional development and to the arts. Professor Rosalind Croucher, could you kindly share your lessons learned as a national human rights institution engaged on the issue at national level? How can national human rights institutions advance protections of intersex people from these harmful practices? The Australian Human Rights Commission has made recommendations to governments in Australia. How are governments responding? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the well, question, series of questions. And thank you to the prior speakers um, who framed the issue so well. And I'm bringing into this conversation the perspective of a national human rights institution and the work that we did in Australia to provide a report that looked at the situation of intersex people from the perspective of human rights. 
And in, in our previous speakers, we've heard both the practical issues of implementation in law and the medical issues. Um, I want to just add in a description of what we did in terms of framing the questions in human rights terms. Many of the controversial and contested interventions have occurred clearly when individuals were infants or as, as children too young to be able to provide their own consent. And decisions about these procedures have often been made based on prevailing social attitudes and the available research base, both of which have changed in important ways over recent years. And our previous speakers gave us a sense of those attitudes, but also the approach to these questions through the lens of social expectations and medical understanding. So in our report, we seek to provide a pathway forward to addressing a challenging set of human rights issues by putting into place better protections for children who do not have the legal capacity to make life-altering decisions for themselves. And we framed our work using five fundamental human rights principles. And we've heard a little of this in our previous speakers, but for us, it defined everything in our report. The first was the bodily integrity principle. Mm -hmm. The second was children's agency, that the ability of children to understand consent can develop as they mature. The third principle was a precautionary one. That is, don't intervene unless you really have to. Wait, precautionary principle. The medical necessity principle, which I'll talk about in a minute, and independent oversight principle. So the combination of those principles led to the central recommendation that medical interventions modifying sex characteristics of children without personal consent, and by personal consent, we mean of the children affected. So medical interventions may only occur in circumstances of medical necessity so this, this is different from the situation that Kari was talking about because it, it only allows interventions without personal consent in circumstances of medical necessity and defined in three ways. We're required to urgently avoid serious harm. Second, the risk of harm cannot be mitigated in another less intrusive way, an intervention cannot be further delayed. In other words, precautionary. And thirdly, the risk of harm outweighs the significant limitation on human rights that is occasioned by medical intervention without personal consent. So circumstances of medical necessity limit um, where a person is unable to give personal consent. And we're not talking about consent of parents, consent of doctors, we're talking about personal consent. And we advocated that this should be the rule in relation to medical interventions for people under the age of 18 years, reflecting a person's rights of autonomy and agency over their own body. And we supported that a bit like Kari was describing in Iceland, this is supported by the establishment of independent panels of experts to define the circumstances when interventions for medical necessity may be made with an expedited process for medical emergencies. So that model supports the medical practitioner and the parents in that moment of being faced with a situation what do we do? The medical practitioner has the, for a start, the medical practitioner is not allowed. In fact, we recommended it be criminal to intervene, but the medical practitioner is not on their own. 
they have behind them the independent panel of experts to provide the guidance um, and the authorization if necessary. The second situation is for situations other than medical necessity, the issue is one of informed consent. The independent panel would also have a role in authorising medical interventions for a person under the age of 18 where that person has established that they do have the ability to provide personal consent and has provided that. that this recognises that the agency of children themselves can grow, particularly in that age group 16 to 18 that we've seen in, in other circumstances. So here the focus is on the ability of children to participate in the decisions and that adequate time for treatment decisions should be made. So as a child's own decision-making ability develops, develops, they may be able to give personal consent, but the independent panel would be the authorising body in relation to medical intervention for children. So parents are not left on their own. The doctors are not left on their own. There is a, um, a rigorous backbone of expertise, time and human rights. So the recommendations in our report, first of all, they were developed in consultation with key groups, um, our um, intersex and, and other um, advocacy groups in Australia were absolutely crucial to the development of the recommendations, as indeed was the input from key clinicians, including paediatricians, endocrinologists and psychiatrists, as well as from legal, human rights and government agencies. And where um, the medical profession were involved, they were very open about the difficult decisions they need to make and considered that they have always acted in the best interests of their patients. Benevolent concern was, at, was definitely um, a hallmark of the, the medical profession's interventions, um, the idea that they always worked in the best interests of the children and the families. And the, the parents, of course, loving parents who were placed in difficult situation, maybe feeling pressured in the moment, but um, things have moved on and the way we anchored our recommendations in human rights um, is a reflection of how important that moving on is um, for people who are born with variations in sex characteristics and also that they are supported through life, um, particularly where children have had interventions um, in the old form um, without their consent and that may have caused lifelong uh, traumatic injury to their mental health and well-being. So that's our report as the National Human Rights Institution. We are a federation in Australia, and um, while we make recommendations at the, the national level reflecting our international obligations, in um, large measure it is for the, the particular states and territories to enact particular laws themselves, and so far, um, the Australian Capital Territory Government has legislated this year. That was mentioned and um, by Mauro, I think. And um, it went through an independent reform process, just as we did. And it does reflect a similar re approach with restrictions on the kind of interventions that may be made and an independent oversight body. But they also took the approach of criminalising interventions um, of the kind that we were describing. So that's a quick summary of uh, the work we've been doing in Australia. And we will continue to advocate for the human rights approach in all situations. And I am very grateful to those in this room that have participated in the process in my fine country. So thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute tonight. It is tonight for me. It is just, it's just um, ticked over midnight for me. Um, so thank you for that. And I'll hand back to our fine moderator. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rosalind. It's so interesting to hear about the important role of national human rights institutions can play in such processes and of the progress you are seeing at national level. I want to thank you. Thank you very much for your time and staying so late with us. And I wish you a pleasant evening further. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your wonderful insights. Thank you so much. Our speakers have laid our international human rights law framework, given us an overview of developments and challenges at global level, and has helped us to examine the practical experiencing of advancing human rights of each six person at national level. Given the wealth of experience of this panel, we would like now to ask the audience for questions and also for contributions you may have from your national or regional context. I have been seeing some questions in the Q&A section and thank you so much for our esteemed panelists um, for answering the questions, but please feel free to continue asking questions. If you do have a question, um, you can raise your hand or you can put it in the Q&A session. We also have some interventions um, from state um, this afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are from. Um, and I think I would, I would want to open the floor um, for our first member of state, um, which is from the US Special Envoy Offices. And I would like to give Kimberly Zisselman um, from the US the floor. Kimberly, are you here? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Sorry, I'm uh, trying to also take off my uh, or put on my camera and it doesn't seem to be working for some reason. Um, anyways, <laughs> it's more important that you can hear me. Apologies for that. Um, yes, this is all um, really, really exciting to hear. Um, about particularly the progress and you know the challenges are, are you know not surprising to me at all. I think Mara listed out a number of challenges, um, as did our friends in Iceland and Australia, um, Australia to be seen around implementation. You know that's always that's always the next level of challenge, which um, to me as a former uh, intersex activist heading up an NGO in the United States you know, is a reminder that as intersex persons and advocates, our work will never be done. That's just the truth of it. Um, but it's really encouraging to see so many colleagues um, and so many activists and so many allies in a variety of professional fields globally starting to understand what intersex is and, and work with the community and work with member states um, to, to protect the rights of, of, of intersex persons. So. From, from the perspective of the Special Envoy's Office here at the State Department in the United States, I'm really pleased to say that um, advancing the human rights of all intersex persons is one of uh, the State Department's uh, top priorities coming out of our office in particular. Um, despite the fact that the anti-LGBTQI, particularly anti-trans, uh, laws here at the state level in the United States are prolific and it's, it's a bit of a dismal um, dismal time here for LGBTQI plus persons. Um, at the federal level in the Biden administration, which of course is the State Department and, and my office, the Special Envoy's office, we are 100% um, supportive of advancing the human rights of intersex persons as well as LGBTQI. Um, and that is uh, our mandate from the president. So as long as we are working under this administration, we will be moving forward as much as possible um, to advance the human rights globally, um, including I can I can say next week, um, the State Department is privileged to be able to bring in five uh, global experts, intersex experts. Uh, one of them is, is here today with us, Morgan Carpenter. Um, who will be coming to the US, coming to Washington next week um, at the invitation of the State Department, specifically with others to educate my colleagues here and really try to socialize intersex human rights, um, what, the, what the issues are um, here in Washington, DC. So I think that's a really strong uh, sign 
that we are really invested in advancing the human rights of intersex persons. And again, I just appreciate all the hard work and expertise of everyone on this call. Um, you're all extremely impressive and I just can't underscore enough how much we need strong allies and we need to work collectively both in the LGBTQI space as well as the children's rights space, the disability rights space, reproductive justice space. It's a very intersectional issue. And I think that's really important, particularly when we're working in some countries um, and cultures where it's very difficult to advance LGBTQI human rights um, and therefore intersex can be advanced in other ways, you know, such as through children's rights. So thank you again for, um, for putting on this webinar today. Thank you so much, Kimberly, and I wish you all the best um, in Washington, D.C. next week. And just to echo what Doug has said, if you have any comments, suggestions, questions, or concerns, um, kindly submit them through the Q&A button on Zoom. I would now want to pass over to Francisco Lopez Lorenzana from Spain for another state intervention. Francisco, you can go ahead. Hello, Crystal. Can you hear we me? Can you. Yep. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, well, just uh, thank you very much for all the panelists and uh, for the intervention before me. Uh, I just want to make a, a quick uh, reference to uh, the law that we uh, passed this year at the beginning of uh, in February. It's the law for 2023 for the real equality of uh, trans people and uh, for the guarantee of LGTB rights. It has um, a few um, a few reference in the law regarding to intersex people. Um, this uh, law takes uh, challenges, all these harmful practices that we have been talking about, especially uh, it prohibits all practical or, or practices of uh, uh, genital modification in all uh, intersex people under 12 years old. Uh, so it's uh, really a, a change uh, comparison to the regulation that we had before. From 12 to 16 years of age, uh, you will need the consent of the minor. Also, there will be some, some, uh, some, um, uh, some of course, if, if that person is mature enough, but, but it will, it, they will need the consent of uh, the family of the minor. And then after uh, 16 years of age, of course, uh, uh, they can decide by themselves uh, together with a, with a medical practice. Uh, this change is really, uh, really something uh, very interesting because it has, uh, the, as, 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 as previous speaker have said before, the, uh, the general regulation meant that uh, uh, when they were babies, they were already making uh, gen uh, genital modifications. Uh, the law speaks about genital modification and non-mutilation, which is more or less the same. But uh, um, And then uh, one aspect that is very important in the law is that we have to, we are also not federal, but uh, we, we have uh, uh, autonomous communities and they, uh, every communi uh, community has their own uh, legislative power and and they they are the ones that have to to apply all the um, all the health uh, measures. So um, uh, the administration, the public administration, should uh, regulate and impose protocols in order to to apply this law. So um, uh, so the the law will be applied in the whole of Spain, but. Uh, every autonomous community, most of them already have a law for uh, trans people and uh, intersex people. So uh, they will have to apply new uh, medical protocols, uh, informed consent, and of course, uh, respect the wishes of uh, those uh, who are, uh, who are uh, on, on an age of consent from 12 to 16 and beyond. Also, um, there is a new provision. Uh, the uh, the families of the babies born will will have to will have up to a year to decide if they want to put uh, the baby as a female or or male. Uh, we don't have a, a 
um, third chance that's only going to be male or female. But the good thing is that uh, in, in our legal system, you can always change the sex afterwards uh, in, in the case that uh, the person decides that uh, he wants to be inscribed as a boy or as a girl, as a male or female. Um, it, it's only been six months since the law was approved, so there are still some challenges, especially regarding all the medical uh, department and the formation that uh, doctors and uh, all the medical system will need to, to apply this new law. Uh, and, but there is a provision also to have a, uh, an impact on the education because uh, one part of the discrimination is in the schools. So uh, the new law um, gets... Uh, uh, has in the in the article 24 some provisions to have uh, uh, programs in in all the schools so all the trans people and the uh, intersex people will be uh, will will, will divulgate uh, and and there will be some uh, um, information about uh, this uh, um, the difference between uh, that that these people have, and and so there will be no 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 so much discrimination between the uh, pupils, and of course the teachers. Uh, so um, there are all these challenges that uh, our previous speakers from, especially from Iceland or from Argentina, have talked about, and from Australia. Of course, uh, mm, the new law doesn't mean that I, since we have uh, uh, new rights, it's going to be. Uh, completely perfect, but uh, we will be working on it. We are aware of the problems, and uh, hopefully, uh, we we can uh, have uh, um, we can avoid all the harmful practices and 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 be respect the 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 rights of the intersex people too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that intervention, Francisco. Um, we have a hand um, for Katerina Slava. You can go ahead. Perfect. Um, also, if there are additional state interventions, um, I do believe that we have Aaron um, Giardina from Malta and Martin Federico Arpas from Argentina. If you'd like to provide interventions, can you please um, raise your hands? Hi, can you hear me? Perfect, Aaron, you can go ahead. Thanks. Hi, uh, Aaron Giardina from uh, Republic of Malta. Uh, so yes, so Malta has had adopted uh, legal provisions when it comes to intersex uh, persons. Now, since 2016, uh, it was in fact one of the first few countries that have adopted such provisions. In fact, uh, you might have uh, came across in your works uh, with the Valletta Declaration, which was uh, when a quite a few demands have been made by intersex rights organizations, primarily also being OII Europe, when it comes to the respect towards their bodily autonomy. Uh, in fact, the law in Malta, which was uh, uh, adopted through our parliament in 2016, uh, and also being uh, as part of a uh, greater law, so to speak, was the Gender Identity, Gender Expression and Sex Characteristics Act, uh, uh, specifically Article 14, which prohibited the normalizing, surger normalizing surgeries and medical interventions on intersex children without their informed consent. Uh, so our laws primarily does not allow any medical professional to operate on uh, or do surgery on any infant without, uh, uh, of course, getting the consent of the child. So, of course, it means that uh, the child has to be certified as able to provide uh, their informed consent, unless, uh, so to speak, uh, there are any uh, threats to the particular imminent threat to the health. Uh, so, of course, some variation would, would require that there would be intervention in order to uh, safeguard the infant's uh, life. Also, this particular act has uh, uh, allowed or has uh, uh, sort of kick-started 
the revision of the protocol regulating sex assignment treatment uh, and those surgical interventions. Uh, in fact, the uh, intersex protocol review working group has been in operation, unfortunately, for longer than envisaged. So we were hoping it would not take so long. Uh, but unfortunately, it is still ongoing. So the review of this protocol is still ongoing. Uh, and we hope to adopt such protocol, such new protocol in the coming uh, month, uh, hopefully by the end of this year or by the beginning of the next, uh, which ultimately would solidify what our act already stipulates, so what our law already stipulates. In essence, uh, children are there are still no surgeries being done uh, so even though that the protocol is not adopted we are pretty much rest assured that there are still no interventions being done unnecessary interventions being done on intersex children how do we know that because similarly to Iceland, which has so ably uh, provided the intervention earlier we are a small country Erin, we, we seem to have lost And you. we know that... Yeah. Oh, okay. You are you back now. now. Yes, okay. yes, yes. I'm very sorry. Uh, so yes, being a very small country and having one particular professional who uh, sees intersex children, we are almost uh, certain that no interventions, unnecessary interventions have been made on the bodies of intersex children. Similarly to Spain, uh, we also have provisions with our within our uh, legal procedures, which stipulates that uh, uh, parents can decide not to assign a particular gender to their child until the age of 18. So uh, one can stay without uh, a particular gender marker on their birth certificate until the age of 18, at which point they would need to go, uh, choose between an M or an F. It is a government commitment also for the next five years to uh, include a third legal gender, which also that means would be available to uh, intersex persons to also opt for an X marker on the birth certificate. As it stands right now, people can opt to an X marker only on their ID cards, documents and passports. So it is rather a non-declaration of gender rather than a third marker. So uh, it's a government commitment for the coming uh, five years within our LGBTIQ equality strategy and action plan. Uh, that's my intervention, thank you. Thank you so much for that intervention, Aaron. Um, we have two more state interventions and I would like you to, to ask you to please keep it briefly and then we will have final questions and remarks from our panelists. I would now love to pass over to Mikalis Ritalis from Greece. You have the floor, um, Mikalis. Yes, uh, good afternoon from Athens. Thank you so much for, uh, for this wonderful, for organizing this wonderful um, webinar. And I would like to thank also our, our uh, very, uh, uh, our panelists for their uh, thorough intervention. Very quickly, I would like to give you a few points on the progress that Greece has made in relation to the protection of intersex people. Um, First of all, I would like to, to mention that um, the protection of intersex people uh, is included in the national strategy on LGBTQI plus equality, which is um, a personal initiative of the prime minister, Mr. Kyriakos Mitsotakis. And the strategy was adopted in 2021. Um, action, uh, actions from this national strategy are included in the annual action plan of all ministries and are, are monitored annually by the General Secretariat for Coordination, which is under the presidency of the government. So the National Strategy on LGBT2, LGBTQI plus equality uh, adopts a whole of government approach. So within this um, institutional framework in 2022, Two, uh, Greece has uh, promulgated a law on reforms in medically assisted reproduction, which prohibits explicitly medical procedures and treatments performed on, on intersex children. Such, such interventions can now only be performed on intersex minors who have reached the age of 15 and only with their free and informed consent. And of course, if medical operations are carried out and result in the sex 
of the intersex person being different and inconsistent with the, the one already registered at birth, it is possible to correct the registered sex by court order. What I would like to say, and I would like to, to close my, my, my sort of intervention with that, is that according to, to the strategy from 2016 onwards, um, the parameter of sex characteristics has begun to appear next to the already existing ones of gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation in a growing number of pieces of legislation regulated various issues related to social life. So apart from the sex normalizing intervention, the banning on, of sex sex normalizing interventions, uh, the sex characteristics appears in the law on the legal recognition of gender identity, on the public incitement to violence or hatred, on the discrimination in the field of employment as, um, as uh, a ground for uh, discrimination, on uh, of the law on racist and sex sexist crimes, as well as on the law on higher education and violence and bullying in schools. Um, well, I think I should stop now since I think that the time has passed. Thank you so much for giving me um, some time to inform you on my country's uh, developments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michaelis, for that intervention. Um, I would love to pass over to Argentina, Martin Frederico Apals. You can go ahead. Sí, Martín, ahora sí te escuchamos. Bien, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar, eh, agradecer eh, la invitación eh, y este espacio. Eh, yo formo parte del despacho de la diputada nacional Gabriela Esteves. Estoy aquí en su representación, eh, ya que ella se encontraba con actividad parlamentaria. Eh, queríamos nosotros más que nada eh, compartir eh, nuestra, nuestra experiencia eh, desde nuestro espacio institucional eh, que tiene que ver específicamente con eh, los esfuerzos que estamos desarrollando en articulación con las organizaciones de la sociedad civil eh, para impulsar un proyecto de ley de protección integral a las características sexuales en la Argentina. Este es un proyecto que fue elaborado por las propias organizaciones, en particular por Justicia Intersex, eh, con el apoyo de la Red Plurinacional Intersex, de Avosex, y el apoyo de otras organizaciones eh, eh, argentinas, eh, Intersex y LGBTI, eh, es un proyecto que antes de, de que nosotros, nosotras y nosotros en, entráramos en contacto con las organizaciones, ya tenía un recorrido previo en el Senado. Luego, en el año 2020, y, hicimos la primera presentación en la Cámara de Diputados y Diputadas. Y eh, el año pasado, en el 2022, lo volvimos a representar, siempre buscando, además, en conjunto con las organizaciones eh, autoras y promotoras del proyecto, que eh, poder eh, recoger un apoyo parlamentario transversal en términos eh, políticos y de los bloques. Eh, eso en lo que tiene que ver estrictamente con, con, lo, con lo institucional. Eh, bueno, el proyecto aborda eh, entre sus objetivos cuestiones que, que se han dicho aquí, además forma parte de este foro Mauro Cabral, que es quien ha, con un, una pieza fundamental de, de, y, y clave en este, en este trabajo que venimos desarrollando, y, y redactor y autor, digamos, de este proyecto, eh, entre los objetivos del mismo está, bueno, obviamente garantizar el derecho a la diversidad corporal y sexual, a la autonomía y la integridad corporal, el derecho a la consignación del sexo, el derecho a la información, incluyendo la historia clínica, el derecho a la no discriminación, el derecho a la atención integral eh, de salud, eh, garantizar eh, 
la inclusión de las características sexuales y sus variaciones en la ESI, en la educación sexual integral, y por supuesto también el derecho a la verdad, eh, que es un tema además muy importante y cara a la historia de las argentinas, eh, los argentinos y las argentinas. Eh, por último, y eh, para no robar más tiempo, contarles que eh, como forma de eh, promover el tratamiento de este tema y sobre todo la visibilización de esta problemática desde nuestro lugar en el Congreso y particularmente en la Cámara de Diputados y Diputadas de la Nación, eh, venimos eh, intentando eh, y visibilizar, incorporar esta cuestión en otros debates conexos, por ejemplo, en diciembre del año 2020, durante el debate en la Cámara de Diputados y Diputadas por la Ley de Interrupción Voluntaria del Embarazo, eh, en la intervención de la diputada Gabriela Esteves, eh, se intentó visibilizar a todas las identidades y, colecti y colectivos eh, con capacidad de gestar eh, a la hora de, de dar este debate y se reclamó desde, desde el propio recinto y desde el propio debate la necesidad de dar la discusión allí en la Cámara Baja eh, respecto a los derechos humanos de las personas intersex y más recientemente, por dar un último ejemplo y con esto cierro, en el debate eh, respecto de la reforma eh, de las licencias laborales en nuestro país y más específicamente en la reforma de la ley de contrato de trabajo por sugerencia de la diputada Esteves se incorporó en el dictamen de mayoría una reforma del artículo 172 de la ley de contrato de trabajo respecto al principio de igualdad y paridad de géneros en el cual se establece de manera explícita la prohibición de trato discriminatorio en, en el ámbito del trabajo eh, a las eh, y respecto de los ingresos, participación y ascenso de las personas trabajadoras eh, por motivos de sus características sexuales, entre otros motivos, lo cual nos parece un avance eh, también eh, muy importante en la materia y que queríamos compartir con ustedes. Eh, nada, quedo a disposición de cualquier pregunta eh, y simplemente manifestar que para nosotros esta es una eh, lucha fundamental que se enmarca dentro de la larga tradición en defensa de los derechos humanos que tiene nuestro país y que hoy están en riesgo y que la respuesta política, institucional eh, para nosotros a, esa, a ese avance de, de la extrema derecha eh, tiene que ser avanzar, eh, y no, no retroceder, sino avanzar en más derechos, en más reconocimiento, en más ampliación y en la defensa irrestricta de los derechos humanos de toda la población argentina. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Martin, for that intervention. Um, I would like to thank everyone um, for the intervention. As we're about to wrap up, we will move to final questions um, to our panelists and then close the session. Thank you again so much for spending your time with us. I would like to pose a question tomorrow. Maro, I would love to ask you, um, could you tell us more about the state of funding for intersex movements? How does it impact in policy and law reform processes and what responsibilities it may place on the state? Thank you, Maro. Maro has just indicated that he has to leave. Um, so, um, I okay, thank, thank you so much on. for that. For, for, for that. Um, Morgan, do you want to touch on that question a little bit on the state of funding for intersex movements? Just a short, brief answer. Um, th th thank you, um, uh, Crystal. Um, as, as a movement, I think internationally, the, the, the intersex movement is, is quite poorly resourced and... and um, I, I think there are a range of factors that contribute to that. Uh, amongst them, I, I think, are uh, a lack of awareness of the existence of our population and, and often a, uh, a confusion about what it is that we're trying to address. 
Um, and I think we also face issues where we talk about uh, trying to end harmful practices in medical settings. We, we, we face um, a lot of the questions that people have been addressing here today uh, about whether what doctors do can be considered to be a harmful practice or not. Uh, and we've heard very clearly, I think, today that, that, that many jurisdictions are now acknowledging that, that certain practices are harmful practices. Anyway, so I think there's been a, 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 a situation where, where I think we face lack of awareness, we face disbelief, and I think we also face um, significant um, impacts from uh, the far right, as, as was mentioned by the, uh, the, the speaker from Australia. Um, and I think all of these issues make it very difficult for individuals to connect with each other and to come together and organize. Um, and those are issues that we face when we're trying to talk with donors as well. Um, Mauro is working for an organization called the Global Philanthropy Project, which is currently trying to document the state of funding for the intersex movement. Um, and I hope that the results for that might come out next year and that you can see some change in the uh, funding that um, some donors are providing to this movement. Um, but I think you'll generally see that the intersex movement remains very poorly funded, very poorly resourced, uh, and that affects the kind of voice that we can express out in, um, in public debate. Uh, and it makes this kind of event where we can talk directly with governments uh, incredibly valuable and useful. And I'm very grateful for you all to be here today. Um, thank you so much, um, Morgan, and I would like to thank all our panelists for your valuable contributions, as well as all the participants who engaged in this discussion. I think it has been a really interesting and inspiring one, showing us how we can and should continue to build societies that are more inclusive and move towards intersex people obtaining their human rights. As we wrap up, I'd like to turn to Morgan Carpenter, which has just briefly spoken. Morgan is an intersex man, a bioethicist, and executive director of Intersex Human Rights Australia. Morgan is also a research affiliate at the University of Sydney School of Public Health. Amongst many other achievements, Morgan has made key contributions to the introduction of Australia's first legislation to protect the rights of intersex people with innate variations of sex characteristics characteristics in medical settings and to the 2021 Australian Human Rights Commission report on the health of human rights human rights of people born with variations in sex characteristics. Morgan was also one of the drafters of the draft technical note that you have received. Morgan, I invite you to close the event. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, and, and thank you very much to all of you for participating in this event across many different time zones. Um, um, uh, Inna Marie Blomeyer, um, Dr. Blomeyer uh, opened the event. Um, she, her words didn't come first, but, but what she said, I think, provides a really good framing for this event. Uh, and Dr. Blomeyer said that, that um, Dr. Blomeyer recognized that inclusion of intersex persons does not simply mean to add an I to LGBT. Um, it means ensuring that everyone can live a dignified life that respects also the right to personal agency. Um, and Dr. Blomeyer said that outlawing harmful practices should be a priority. Uh, Dr. Tlaleng Mofokeng, uh, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, spoke as a witness of events surrounding the birth of newborn infants in her role as a medical doctor. Uh, and talked about how she saw a focus on cosmetic interventions uh, on children without consideration of uh, their physiological needs uh, or the need that, that parents and children would have for psychosocial support. And she identified a need for improvements to medical education. Um, Dr. Tlaleng also talked about key principles that shape the right to health, including the rights to non-discrimination, equality, transparency, participation, accountability, and recourse. 
Um, Mauro Cabral Grinspan was our civil society expert, and he talked about the role of intersex organizing in addressing human rights violations and in providing support for families and individuals. Um, Mauro talked about how we now know that legislative protections are achievable and possible, um, even where some mistakes may have been made. And I think that's probably inevitable to some extent with every new area of legislation. Mauro talked about challenges, including the existence of exceptions, uh, for example, for masculinizing surgeries. Um, and the lack of redress for, pair, for, for adults um, and the lack of attention to adults' needs to access health care and adults' um, right to truth about what has happened to their bodies. And Mara also mentioned the spread of legislation explicitly permitting surgical interventions. Um, and as somebody in Australia, I have to say that legislation explicitly permitting surgical interventions on children with intersex traits has a long history. And here we have examples of legislation prohibiting female genital mutilation that also contains exemptions permitting surgical interventions uh, on children whose characteristics are seen as atypical. Harry Homo Ragnarsson uh, talked about this as, a, as an initially almost entirely invisible issue. Um, but um, the Icelandic government brought together an interdisciplinary working group in 2019 and legislated the following year after what was described as a very tricky process. And Kauri talked about legislation as a compromise where um, social, psychosocial and appearance related factors were no longer considered acceptable for surgical intervention there should be oversight, but most, but masculinizing interventions are largely excluded from protections. That was talked about as, as reflecting uh, a compromise with clinicians, but it also appears that implementation has been challenging uh, with evidence of non-compliance by clinicians with the legislation as passed. Um, and Kari also talked about a review of the legislation um, at the end of this year. Uh, but really, I think the, the, what, one of the most striking questions that, that Kari's presentation raises for me is, is the, um, the, the, well, it's, it's a really fundamental question that, that compromise has not produced compliance with legislation. And what does that mean for legislation? Um, Dr. Rosalind Croucher from the Human Rights Commission uh, has talked about how um, her institution established a national inquiry, um, uh, I think in 2017, that reported in 2021. It addressed Australia's obligations under international human rights treaties and um, has considered a rights-based approach to medical intervention. Uh, considering also what actually is meant by the concept of medical necessity in a contested area of medicine. Um, the Human Rights Commission in Australia has called for um, a new set of principles to establish when medical intervention should be permitted. Um, and uh, these aim to respect individuals' rights to autonomy and agency over their own body. Uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission also recommends implementation of legal protections uh, with the prohibition and criminalization of certain procedures uh, and oversight for some medical interventions. Um, Rosalind also mentioned how the Australian Capital Territory one of eight state and territory jurisdictions has now enacted reforms associated with this. Um, and I would add that the that, that territory in Australia has also invested in the provision of psychosocial support, which speaks to some of the issues raised by Mauro and Dr. Tlaleng. Um, 
in the Q and A, questions have come up um, repeatedly about sex markers, sex classifications, and so whether or not new sex markers or sex classifications can address harmful practices in medical settings. And um, I would just like to just briefly comment that we know empirically from the experience in Germany and in Australia that third sex markers or third sex classifications have not provided a solution to harmful practices in medical settings. Uh, it seems, in fact, that, that, that the existence of third sex markers has, has not changed even processes of sex assignment involving children with innate variations of sex characteristics. Um, and it seems to me that it's very difficult to escape questions about how people should identify. Um, and I, I'd like to suggest to you all that you consider um, suggestions um, that intersex people as a group, as a homogenous group, should uh, be assigned to a particular classification or should identify in a particular way. In the same way that you consider um, the idea that, that children with intersex variations should undergo medical intervention. Um, that the key question is actually about giving people autonomy and choice and the ability to express for themselves who they are and how they want to be, and to kind of minimize actions that stigmatize them through medical intervention or through um, uh, through new classifications uh, before they're able to express their own views about how they want to be treated. Um, it's it's eleven forty in the morning here, so I'm sorry if I didn't make complete sense. But but um, um, I'm. I hope that that's a fairly succinct summary about the question of identity. Um, I'd just like to finally just mention that, that um, we can see some questions that have come up that we haven't clearly answered in the session today. We can see concerns about the effectiveness of legislation, concerns regarding compliance with legislation, um, and we know that there is very limited reporting of the success uh, of implementation of reforms where they exist. So I think these are very much questions for the coming years about how we can make sure that legislation is successful, how it can achieve what is intended. Um, and I just like to mention that, that you know, Dr. Tlaleng and Mauro have both talked about the need to address stigma and provide support uh, for families and individuals. Um, and this is a key area, I think, where resources are needed uh, in the future, whether, whether, there, whether jurisdictions do implement legislation or not. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. And once again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our interventions from state. Thank you everyone that asked the question. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope this sparks further conversation and engagement with states on the promotion and protection of intersex human rights. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone.